Welcome to the Alain Guillot podcast, where we speak about personal finance and entrepreneurship. This is episode number 28. Today, we are interviewing Roger Whitney, the retirement answerman. Now, Roger is a person that does many things. Among them, he is a certified financial planner, and he also has a podcast show called The Retirement Answerman. And in addition, he wrote a book called Rock Retirement, a book that addresses the fear, hopes, and dreams that people have about retirement. Now, in this podcast, we go beyond the mathematics of retirement. We speak about the typical retirement plan, whereas a person works until age 65, and then from one day to the other, that person stops working and starts vegetating. But according to Roger, there are many other phases of retirement. There are many ways in which you could be happier a lot sooner before the reaching the retirement age and how you could continue being happy way after retirement. Let's listen to the interview. Hello, Roger. Thank you for taking this call. You bet. Excited to be here. Okay, Roger, listen, I first heard about you when I was listening to a podcast of Afford Anything by Paula Pants and in what it seems to be a friendly debate. And then you say something like, it went like this, I don't believe in early retirement. And I would like to get back to you, back to that in a minute. But before we get started, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about you, your background story. Where do you get your superpowers and how do you get in financial planning? And the most important thing, what are all those letters behind your name? (laughs) Uh, Well, my background is I'm about 51 and I started as a financial advisor in 1991, uh, right at the beginning of the great tech boom. And I don't know if I have any superpowers or not, but whatever wisdom I've gotten over 27 plus years has come from mainly screwing it up a lot and hopefully learning lessons and evolving as I've gotten older. That's one of the advantages of getting older is that you get some perspective and hopefully have some wisdom. So this is all I've ever done. Wow. As far as those letters. So that was part of my evolution. So in the early days, I traded technology stocks because that's a lot of what you did in the mid-90s because it was so easy. And I didn't know any better. And getting those letters was part of becoming, I call it, classically trained as a financial planner and advisor. So if you want me to go through them real quick, I can. But they're all fairly difficult certifications and I just went through them to slowly learn the the fundamentals of the craft so I could learn how what what which ones work well and which ones I think uh, are a little antiquated. Okay, uh listen, in 1991 is when I first began when I first got interested in stocks and you know I didn't know anything about it. I was just watching TV and I was looking at stock charts and I was seeing all these stocks, you know, going up without end and I said wow I can get rich and I bought some stocks myself and that was the first slap in the face that I got because uh, short after of course all these stocks that when I bought I think uh, something called Cisco system and I was going to retire in five years because the way that it was going up it's just you couldn't lose and then it lost of course and that was also my first painful lesson into the stock market and then from there i started reading and i started uh, seeing how things really work so yeah that was a humbling experience yeah it can be depending on when you got in because at the time most things just went up and if you were brave enough just to keep investing and betting on they would go up you did well and it was interesting during that time frame as an advisor especially a newer advisor it felt pretty easy right? Because everything went up. It was sort of easy to make money. And clients around that time were making decisions like on retirement or whether to buy that brand new house or things like that based on the assumption that the same kind of returns they got during that big internet boom were going to continue. Okay. So now let me ask you this. How is it that you became specialized on retirement? Because I went to the website and that's all or basically all you do. You talk about retirement. You are called the retirement answer man. And out of the whole spectrum of things that we can do as financial advisor, why do you pick this field? 
Well, there's a, there's a couple layers to that. One is it's the majority of my clients are in that stage of life. Two is as I've matured and my business has matured, you know, when you're not as worried about eating as much as about, uh, you know, being all that you can be from a life perspective, retirement, it's, I've decided to focus there. So I only work with clients over 50 that are either working on that transition in the middle of it or trying to live out after the transition. And the reason I focus there is because they're all dealing with the same issues. And there's wisdom that can be gained by specializing. You know, if you think if you go to a doctor, a general practitioner sort of does everything, right? But when it gets beyond the basics, they usually refer to a specialist. And the reason they do that is because a specialist, one, he deals with, say, stomach issues, right? That's all he deals with or she deals with all day long is stomach issues. So they're an expert in that area. And they've done so much work there that they've seen the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything else. So there's a lot of wisdom there. Where it's the same thing, I think, when you're working with a financial advisor is I didn't want to be a general practitioner, which I had been. And I was old enough and mature enough to know, okay, where I think my sweet spots are. And so I decided I'm just going to be the specialist in this area because there's going to be so much wisdom of working with so many people dealing with all the same problems. So that's, uh, it was an evolution. It didn't happen overnight. Okay. So as far as I know, at one time in history, people used to work for a particular company, let's say IBM or whatever company you want to mention, and you will work for that company for 40 years. And then after that time period, you will get a pension and you wouldn't have to think anything at all about retirement. I mean, that's something that the company did and you will just get your check. You, you will get your golden pen at the end of uh, when you arrive 65 and you will start getting your pension. Can you give us, yes, an idea? of how things have changed since those all time. Well, there are definitely people that have those pensions, but I think the key difference is, and I talk about it in my book, is that, you know, that's the last generation's version of retirement. You know, so take my grandfather. He was in, in, the, mil in the World War II and, and worked as in manufacturing and then worked for the post office. When he retired in 1980, he lived, you know, he was about 60, 62 years old. They moved to Florida they lived about 10 years and then he passed away. And during that 10 years of quote unquote retirement, he was pretty relaxed. He was, his body was worn out from, you know, a harder life. And he was happy just to relax and have a small house and uh, read books and have, you know, visits from family. Today, the more, the modern retiree is very different than that. You know, one, the majority don't have a pension. Two, they're going to live a lot longer than any generation in history. So if you look at a 60-year-old today, they're gonna, they have about a 50-50 chance of living past 90. I hope to live up to 100. There you go. Well, you, you know, you can, you can take some proactive measures to do that. So they're going to live a lot longer. They're not looking at retirement like my grandfather, which was, you know, it's finally his time to rest. They're looking at retirement as, as a, it's finally their time to live on their own terms and have freedom and go do things, which means they're going to spend a lot more money. So it's a very different kind of retirement, no pension, living a lot longer and being a lot more active and spending a lot more money. Well, that changes a lot of the ways we have to think about how you plan for it. Okay, so let's say I just finished college, I'm 22 years old, and I'm looking for a job, and what are the steps that proactively I will have to do? Of course, no 22-year-old person thinks about retirement because that's, you know, they're just thinking about getting drunk on the weekend or the, the next date. But let's say, let's play this fictional character that somehow heard your podcast and he said, okay, maybe I should do a little bit of planning for retirement. What would a person like that do from the beginning of their life? So that's an interesting concept question because let's take that 22-year-old. Well, we know statistically right now a 20-year-old has a 50-50 chance of living past 100. So it's a lot different. I say if you're 20, 22 years old, I don't think you think about retirement. I think you think about obviously building wealth, accumulating wealth, but probably the best investment, and this is probably even into your 40s or 50s, your best investment is into your ability to earn an income. So, you know, you could say you have a dollar and you can invest that in your 401k, and I know you're in Canada, so it could be, I forget what they call it there. RRSP. 
okay, RSP or your taxable account, whatever. You could take that dollar, put it into some type of invest, you know, public investment and hope that that accumulates over time. That's probably a good strategy for a portion of it. You could invest it in real estate, whether it's rental income or something like that. That could be a good investment. You could invest it in a business, right? That, that, right. Could, that could work out for you. Or you could also invest it in learning skills, whether it's book knowledge or practical experience or world experience that give you the ability to earn more income. That's probably one of the best investments a young person can make. Okay. Well, one thing that I, I suggest to people, I'm part of a club called Toastmasters International, which teach public speaking. And I tell young people that for a fee, I think a membership in our club costs $150 per year. And you get the ability to learn how to speak in public, which, you know, in any particular job, just to be able to give a presentation, if you are that one person who is not afraid to stand in front of a group of people and just show some slides or talk about your products or services, that's already a great investment in your future. Is that the kind of a skill you are talking about? I think that is one very good skill. I, w I was a member of Toastmasters for years. And the ability to be able to communicate and express yourself, not just effectively, but in an interesting way, is very powerful. Powerful in the ability to actually communicate, but also powerful in the fact that many people can't. But also, it's a great confidence builder. It helps you carry yourself differently. So I think that's a perfect example of one of the things that you could invest in, your, in yourself that would make you either more marketable to a company over the long term or give you confidence to help you start your own business, whether that's a full-time business or a side hustle or anything in between. Okay, great. Okay, so then I'm this fictional 20-year-old person who, and you just told me, don't worry about saving money, just invest in yourself. Okay, so now I come to you, let's say, um, uh, 10 or 20 years later. Now I'm on my 40s, and I say, well... Uh, you know, um, Roger, I'm now in my 40s. Should I start worrying about retirement or what uh, should be in my mind right now? But, uh, you know, obviously I can't answer for everybody, but here's my opinion of it. And I'm 51 and this is how I'm structuring my life. So the old model that, that almost everybody still uses in the finance world is about retirement as this binary decision. I work and then I save and invest, save and invest until I have enough money and then I stop working, right? So it's all about saving and investing and it, it treats retirement like a binary decision. You're either working or you're not working. Well, there are lots of studies that say work is a, or excuse me, an es essential element of a happy life. Yes, I agree with you. So here's some wisdom to that 22-year-old you know, I work with clients in their 50s and 60s mainly who have hitched their wagon to this traditional concept of retirement, working or not working. And when they enter retirement, they realize it's not all that it's cracked up to be and they end up doing something anyway. Yes, you can only drink so many margaritas or you can only play so many rounds of golf before you get bored, you know? And when I survey like the audience of my show, The Retirement Answer Man, and ask them, what when I, you hear the word retirement, what is it that it means to you in terms of what you want? And overwhelmingly, it's not the absence of work. They just want time freedom. They want time to be able to pursue things that they're passionate about. And But they also want to work, too. They're just tired of the corporate rat race, the meetings, the travel, the all the things that get caught up in these amazing work weeks that companies put people through. So my counsel to a 22-year-old is, rather than try to save and invest solely, I mean, you still got to do that, but rather than try to save and invest and sacrifice so much of your life right now for the hope of a better life later on, you know, that's like climbing Mount Everest, right? You have to suffer for hours and hours, in this case, years and years, to get to the summit, Rather than think of your life that way, think of your life like a trek or a journey where it's not some end goal. You're really just trying to create a life that has work you love, income that supports your lifestyle, and time freedom to pursue other things as well. So basically, you're trying to create a life you don't actually want to retire from. 
I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to just put myself as an example and then you tell me your opinion whether I can consider myself retired or not. So I live a frugal life. I live with 1,500 Canadian dollars, which is, I don't know, probably like 1,300 US dollars. And I get passive income from my real estate of $1,000. So I need to work enough to earn $500 during a month, which I can do very easily. I guess if I work 20 hours during a month, I can meet that gap. Can I say that I am retired at this moment or not? I don't know why you would even want to make the distinction. Just focus on making sure you're building wealth long term. Okay. You know, my only comment is, I'll, I'll refer to Paula Pant on this, is a lot of us focus on frugality. Right. Because that is a, it's an important lever. Don't get me wrong. It is an important lever, but there's only so much frugaling you can do. Right. And I think there's so much potential on the income, income side of things, really limitless, that just because you want to slow down your work pace early or design a life you don't want to retire from, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't make a ton of money. Oh, no. I'm, I have so many projects that produce way in excess of what I need. Just for the title itself, I wonder if, I, if that's a title I could use. Yeah. I mean, you can use whatever title you want. Great, great, great. Okay, good. Well, thank you for that clarification. So... Uh, how would a person do this mixture of working life and retirement? What would be an ideal scenario of a person who wants to put these two facets of their life together? You know, do something meaningful and don't kill yourself working. What would be an ideal scenario? Well, I think it's something that uh, you have to develop on your own. Because everybody has their own version of it. Right now, I'm living my version of it, but I'm working probably as hard or harder than I've ever worked. I just don't feel like it's work. So I'm not, you know, what I'm doing, it may, you know, maybe something that somebody else would say, that's just way, much, way too crazy. I think each of us has to figure out what that balance is. But I think uh, it's easily doable if you take on the personal responsibility of making those decisions and not waiting for a corporation or for someone to tell you. There's a lot of work that has to be done. I think one great thing someone can do is so, to find one or two people that are on that a similar journey and start meeting with them regularly to support each other and challenge each other. That can be very powerful because it's definitely a different way of thinking. Well, I agree with you. Yeah, I haven't had a regular job in maybe 10 years, and I try to focus only on things that I like, and I find myself that I work so much harder because I am enjoying what I'm doing. And, you know, it, it just, it took a little bit of, no, I took honestly a lot of courage to let go of things that have the resemblance to be a steady income and just to go on on my own and do, you know, I hustle here and I hustle there, but I hustle on things that I enjoy doing, so they don't really seem like work. Work. But at the same time, because I enjoy doing them, I work so hard at them that is and it's a rewarding feeling. One of the things that I have been doing, I have been a dance teacher for over 10 years and I only work with people that I like working with. If I don't like someone, I just say, sorry, I'm not available and that's it. And to have that feeling of dancing and getting paid for it, it's just every time a client leaves my studio, I say, God, I'm so happy happy to be able to just do what I just did and in addition to that, get paid for it. So there's a great book to read that I would recommend to anyone that's thinking about this journey. And it was a pivotal book in my life. Uh, it's Lynchpin by Seth Godin. Okay. Then he basically talks about this difference between corporate work, education system, and how to inoculate yourself against a lot of the technology trends and the race to the bottom. And he basically says, you know, become an artist because whatever you do, it could be sweeping the floor. You have your own unique specialness that you bring to anything. And most of us suppress that to conform. And he's just the opposite of leaning into it because that's the one thing that no one's ever going to be able to duplicate or outsource. 
Okay, so yeah, I see my list of books to read. But then going back to the original quote that I used to uh, when I began this podcast, that you don't believe in retirement. So the reason why you don't believe in retirement is because you think that this there should be this intertwine of activities that we should do to the end of our days. And then if we get paid for it, even better. I think that I think that that's a good summary. I would the only caveat I would put to that is I have clients that want the traditional retirement. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think the key is we're all put on this earth to build the best life that we can and and that can take on religious connotations, it could take on a lot of different connotations to be the best version of us. For some people they want traditional retirement because they just want to volunteer, right? They want to give back. That is okay. What I'm arguing is that when we hear the word retirement, because of all the marketing of financial firms and all of the stereotypes we have in our head, it ends up focusing only on investing and saving, which is a very one-dimensional solution to a pretty big problem. So what I'm arguing is, is that we need to be multidimensional and create what our own version of, because that's where we're going to have the best chance of creating our best life. Okay, yes, that's great. I have a friend, and his idea of retirement is to take care of his 10 grandkids. He just wants to be a babysitter for the next 10 years, and that, for him, is the the one thing that he just wants to do, and he just reached retirement age, and he's just so happy taking care of his garden and his 10 grandsons. It's, it's amazing, and yeah, this guy is hallucinating on how happy he is doing that. That's awesome. That is awesome. Okay, so let me ask you, a minute ago, you mentioned something about your book. Can you tell us, uh, first of all, what inspired you to write that book? What was the writing process, and what can we find in that book? Well, the inspiration of the book was a drive from my podcast, which I've done for four years. It you know, presents a lot of the messages and the, the process that I use in my practice in a very organized way. So that was the drive to write it is that, you know, I never, I never had a personal dream of writing a book, but I do have a personal dream of helping people not miss the only life they have. And this book is an important tool in that, I think. In, in terms of the writing process, you know, basically it sucked for me. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I'm a good writer, but I'm not a great writer, and I'm not someone that enjoys writing in that form. I like to talk. I like to think out loud. I like to do my podcast. I like to public speak. So it was difficult from that perspective because I'm much more of an auditory thinker. But I did it because it served a, a greater purpose. Fantastic. And what can we expect to find in your book? I see the uh, the table of contents, but uh, the listeners don't know what's in there. Well, I, the book outlines a lot of what we've talked about. Is What's wrong with the current system? What premises you need to rethink about? how you're managing your financial and structure in your life, and then the process that you should use to start walking that journey to creating a life that's not just simply tied to saving and investing. And it, I think it's a fun book. It's not, you know, there are a lot of technical financial books out there that tell you how to do an IRA rollover and just all this technical stuff. My book, and I wrote it this way purposely, is meant to be a wisdom book, which is a very easy read. Okay, great. I'm looking forward to sharing that information with the listeners. Well, you you said that the book was ins an inspiration from your podcast. And I have listened to your podcast and I am green with envy because I think the quality production is great. The way in which you intermix the music and your voice is just fantastic. I just listen to your series on Bones and it's very well done. Congratulations. But can you tell me how is it that you got, I mean, you have a busy life. You, you, I seen your agenda. You have appointments all over the place. You start working very early. How is it that you found the time and the inspiration to build this podcast and can you tell us the name of the podcast as well yeah the name of the podcast is the retirement answer man it's been running for 220 weekly episodes and i've never missed a week which i'm proud of in terms of how i get it done yeah I, it, what's interesting is i think most people think they're much busier than they really are i think uh i have a lot of different obligations and it's just important enough to me we tend to get the things that are important enough to us done right so whether that's for some people, they say they want to write a book or do a podcast. 
but they never f- time find time for that. But they do find time for television or going out with friends or whatever else. You know, we all have a lot of great intentions that we verbalize, but in the end, it's our actions that tell us what's really important to us. So I, I've never really had an issue in getting it out. I guess it must be important enough to me. Okay. You have regular clients coming to see you, but then you say to yourself, wait, the way that I can help even more people instead of seeing them one-to-one in my office is to have a podcast. I guess that was your train of thought at that moment. Well, the, for me, the podcast was, it started as I'm dealing with the issues. It's, you know, for people over 50 that are dealing with the issues that we've talked about. So I'm dealing with tons of issues like that in my practice that I have to solve for clients. And I, you know, by doing the podcast, if anybody's ever, you know, you talked about Toastmasters, if you've ever given a speech or talked about something publicly, you got to be pretty organized in your head because you're trying to communicate it. And that's the beauty of any kind of teaching is you really got to be a little bit more organized because you can't just wing it. You have to have some thought into how you're going to present it. So What I decided to do is, hey, hey, I'm working on these issues anyway. I think out loud. Why don't I do a podcast thinking about an issue that I'm dealing with with a client, and that will help me become a better advisor. So it's my lab in a way. So it was a nice virtuous circle. So that's the main reason why I started. And then from there, I started to get people listening and interacting. And then it just, I kept leaning into it. So now... I have, I'm blessed that I can work with a, a smaller group of people where I'm actually walking life with them. But I also have this huge, uh, huge to me anyway, community of people really all over the world that I'm interacting with that I never actually get to meet, but I can help them too. And they can actually help me. So it's a nice virtuous circle. Okay. Sounds great. Uh, to go back on making time for the things that you want to do. I I gave up my TV about 15 years ago, and somehow I felt like I have four extra hours every day for the rest of my life. I just gave up this screen that was taking space in my living room, and voila, I have so much more time. So yeah, I can I can sympathize with what you just say. Uh, uh, Roger, let me ask you something. Is there a case story? I, I don't know if this is uh, confidential information or not, but is there a case story of a client that came to you with a problem and that you helped him through to find his way to retirement or to a better life. Is there something like that that you could share with the audience without, of course, saying the name of the client? Uh, obviously not a client because uh, there even a lot of their stuff is, is just confidential. But one thing that uh, you or anyone could check out is twice a year I do a case study with a listener on the show where we, they agree to help me walk them through a truncated version of the process, and I record it. We change their name and some details. And then everybody gets to listen in on the show of me working with this person to define what their ideal retirement is, organize their financial resources, start to think creatively about what steps they could take. And then what the solutions are, we actually do in a webinar. But I do that twice a year. Wow, amazing. Five of them. And uh, we're about to wrap one up. Uh, Episode, it starts with episode 219 is the, the latest edition where we work with Sam who is solo. So she's single to retirement. So episode 219 is where the latest case study starts and goes for three to four weeks. And you get to listen in on Sam and I talking about the different issues. So that would be where I would refer you to. Okay, I will put that in the show notes. Yes, I saw that after the Bond series, I saw that that's the next series you have in the podcast. So that would be interesting to listen to. Okay, so Roger, I know you have a busy schedule, so I don't want to keep you a long time. I would like to ask you the typical questions that I ask at the end of every podcast. Uh, The number one is, and you just mentioned a book, Lynchpin, but can you mention another book that you would recommend the readers to check out, whether it's for retirement or just because it pleases you? Oh, wow. Well, obviously my book, Rock Retirement. Of course. (laughs) I got to do that, right? And then, wow, there are so many. I think one that uh, if you're worried about finding traction and taking action, and working on del- some of the avoidance things like TV and everything else, the 12 week year is a book that can help you set goals and take little baby steps to start working t- towards the goals that you have. Okay. How about podcasts? As a podcaster yourself, is there another podcast that you would like us to refer to? 
Uh, well, probably my favorite financial podcast is Stacking Benjamins. I like that one. Uh, Joe and I are good friends, and I like it a lot. You don't really learn anything there, but it is very entertaining. And from a production standpoint, Joe and I have talked a lot about how we improve the production from a podcast perspective. But it's just a fun show, and he's a good guy. Okay, well, is there anything that I could have asked you that I neglected to ask you? Oh, I don't know, but I think it was a great discussion of how we can rethink some of the things that we operate under so we can put a little less pressure on ourselves. You know, not just trying to create a great tomorrow, but making sure we're take, making the most of today. So uh, what I got is that it's just not a binary process. It's not like now I'm working 40 hours a day and then next week I'm drinking margaritas for the rest of my life. It's something that we can intertwine and maybe mix a little bit of with working today and having a little bit of enjoyment time today as well and mixing it all together until the end of the days. I mean, unless you want the traditional retirement, which is another option, but that's the not and both that I got from our conversation. I think I think that's what you did well with that. Then that's great. Okay, Roger. Well, thank you so much, and uh, I hope to continue listening to your podcast. It's been a pleasure to chat with you. A pleasure for me too. Thank you. I learned so much during this interview. All my life, I thought that what I really wanted was not to have to work forever for the rest of my life. Just sit on the beach, drink margaritas, and that's it. But now that I'm 51 years old, I know that what I like to do is to do something meaningful, something that contributes to our society, but at the same time, it's rewarding to me. At the same time, I have been selling the idea to others that retirement is mostly about accumulating money into your bank account and then Yes, experiencing that retirement life of just doing nothing. And now, in reflecting about it, I think that that idea is being pushed to us or in the financial advisor industry because, you know, when I was a financial advisor, my job was to sell products. My job was to sell high-fee mutual funds and bonds and insurance, and that was a financial advisor. So this is what we were tend to believe that the career of being a financial advisor is. But when someone like Roger comes and says something different, that retirement is about enjoying your life and not to worry so much about accumulating all that money and enjoy the days that you have today. Don't waste your life in order just to have money into your bank account. Those ideas are revolutionary. And in addition to that, there is no commission involved into those selling those ideas. There is, so the traditional financial advisor industry will have a hard time charging a commission on that kind of advice. So I think that's the one thing that is so peculiar about Roger's advice that is something geared toward the enjoyment of life. It's not something geared toward the accumulation of assets that people can later on charge a commission. So what I really learned from this interview is that in order to be happy, in order to be a successful person in retirement, number one, we have to find work that we love and that is meaningful to us. And of course, that work has to have enough income to support our lifestyle and finally to have time and freedom to do other things. Of my life, as I said, I thought that retirement was just that, accumulating $1 million or more and see my bank account grow. But as I reflect, it's more than that. As I'm into my 50s, I know for sure that I just don't want to sit in my couch and watch Netflix. I want to be active. I want to do things. And if I can do things and at the same time get paid for them, even the better. But that's the idea of retirement. Be active, have active life that can sustain your lifestyle. And for you, for the audience, well, I challenge you to consider these ideas, to consider maybe finding a way to marry the things that you like to do with some income. And that way you can work for the rest of your life and you can enjoy what you're doing. I found this quote in the internet that goes like this. Find a job that you enjoy doing and you will never have to work a day on your life. One more time, Roger. Thank you for your insight. Thank you for opening my eyes. And thank you for sharing your ideas with my audience. 
Now, before we close, I would like to talk to you about a side hustle that I did for many years. Actually, I did this side hustle for about five years. Well, for about five years, I was an Airbnb host. At one time, I had three properties that I was managing and renting through Airbnb. And my girlfriend at the time, she had two properties. So between the two of us, we had five properties. And these five properties produced enough cash flow that we were able to buy. Well, I have now a rental property that allows me to sustain my lifestyle. It gives me rental income every month. And yes, it makes my life so easier. So if you were thinking about a side hustle, a way to earn money on the side, I propose this idea, Airbnb. I propose it to all my friends. I've been promoting it. So, and well, and this is the thing. If you go and do it through my website, if you go to my website and search for the Airbnb logo and through there you become a host, well, you will be contributing towards the production of this podcast, the production of the website, etc., etc. And if you need some guidance on how to become a host, an Airbnb host, I don't mind if you send me an email. I'll be happy to answer to you. On the other hand, if you are a traveler, well, there's nothing less expensive that give you the environment, the real feel of traveling than staying in an Airbnb property as opposed to staying in a hotel. It's a lot cheaper and you really feel like you are living there like the locals. And if you do it to the link in our website, alengio.com, right away from the time that you book that first apartment or house or room or whatever, you will get a discount. Usually is around $25. Sometimes it goes up to $50. It changes all the time so i cannot tell you a precise number but if you do it through the website you will receive a deduction right away one more time guys thank you so much for listening to this podcast and i will talk to you next week thank you for listening to one more episode of the alain guillot podcast for more information please visit the website alain and if you haven't done so please subscribe to the podcast on to soon.